with Chris in their title. But my name is Serena Terry. I am founder of Catchy Co. And I have over 15 years marketing experience. I have guest lectured for the University of Ulster and the Northwest School of Marketing. And I've helped businesses to grow from startup to scale up to now global corporate organizations um, in my professional career lifetime. But as you know, I am also the face of Mammy Butter, and I currently have over 100,000 followers on Instagram and 500,000 followers on TikTok. As well as that, I am also a mum, a wife, and a general agent of a woman. I'm 35, I'm married with two kids, Alfie, my son, is five, and Ava is 12. I suffer with anxiety. If you follow me um, on Instagram or TikTok, you'll notice that I talk quite openly and honestly about it. I am confident and I tend not to care what people think in the right context, of course, not professionally, but equally, I'm my own worst enemy and my biggest critic, which I'm sure we all are at times. I am professional and I do know that I'm great at what I do. But I'm also somebody who doesn't take life too seriously. And I'm sure you can see that from the posts and the content that I create on Mammy Bunter. I am currently learning about the challenges of being a mom in business every single day. I'm quite new to it. Um, Hunter. Huh? Did somebody say something there? I think that was um, just one of our new attendees just oh, not okay. on mute just yet. No worries at all. So this is what I'm talking about, the kind of identity crisis. Um, you guys coming on here and I've seen people sharing stories and posts and saying I can't wait to do a social media masterclass with Mommy Bunter, which is strange because I essentially created Mommy Bunter. She is my alter ego. We do share a lot, probably 100% of personality traits. And she is indeed me, but behind the scenes of Mammy Banter and behind the success of the growth of Mammy Banter underlying is my 15 years of marketing experience and I use Mammy Banter now as my case study and essentially to show you that I practice what I preach and in terms of what I'm going to teach you and inform you and educate you about today to show you that that is essentially the foundation of what I put on my Mammy Banter accounts on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook. There are loads of people who can do comedic content and loads of people who can do reels and use other people's sounds. You'll notice sometimes I do original content that's completely my own. And then other times I do content that's trending or that somebody else has done. The key for me is being able to understand my target market, so my target followers who are predominantly female, say about 90% female from the ages of 25 to 65. And I am sure that the analytics aren't telling me, but I am pretty sure there's a good 50% or even 60% chunk of those that have kids. So since last year, um, well, during the first lockdown, I set up Mammy Banter. And at the time I was working with a software as a service company as chief communications officer. And things started to get quite complicated to say the least when Mammy Banter started to, to kick off. I started her as a bit of crack. I discovered TikTok and I went down the rabbit hole. Anybody that's used it, you'll know it's a complete rabbit hole. You want five minutes and two years later, you're still there. I hated the feel of Facebook and Instagram and was really starting to dislike social media because I felt that the content that I was seeing wasn't what I wanted to see, wasn't good for my mental health, wasn't really entertaining me, and it was too much hard work to try and go and find the content that I wanted to find because I felt at the time the algorithm or the specific channels like Facebook or Instagram that I was on wasn't presenting me with content that I was interested in. At last came TikTok. And that rabbit hole that I fell down was a rabbit hole of people who are in the same demographic as me, around the same age, real life relatable people who were 
absolutely hilarious. And I laughed and laughed. And I have never, I'd say in the last three years, definitely on a social media platform, laughed as much as I did the first night I went on TikTok. And it was just a breath of fresh air in the world of social media. And I just fell in love. I've always been a bit of an idiot. I have always been quite confident to an extent where I wouldn't mind public speaking and putting up a video on TikTok doesn't really feel real at the time. I felt like I was still in my own house. It was locked down. We weren't allowed to see any people. I felt everybody's doing it. It's a bit of crack. And my confidence grew then as people started to relate to my videos, enjoy the context of the content. And that then shaped the content to be over the next few months. I listened quite intently to any comments, any feedback from people. And I also kept an eye on, and still do to this day, of my competitors. My competitors are social, on social media are comedic women who create comedy skits, um, who are relatable. There are quite a few of them, but I always try to keep my finger on the pulse and we'll, we'll cover this in this session and talking about why you also need always need to be keeping an eye on your social competitors not just your business competitors but your social co competitors because you can get so much inspiration from what they're doing what their followers are saying and what kind of engagement they have with their audience so in the last 12 months um mommy banter has grew on social media two months ago i decided that it was starting to get quite conflicting professionally for me as chief communications officer and then having mommy banter it was a kind of unspoken thing in my workplace i had um, news articles contacting me um, publications contacting me saying could they do a post on me i didn't know whether to say i was working they were asking where i was working i was told by my employer at the time not to mention where i was working they didn't really like it but they couldn't really tell me not to do it um, and I'd always wanted to go out on my own and Mammy Banter was at the stage back then where it was 80, 90,000 followers. And I thought, do you know what? I have the experience. I've done lecture and I've done consultancy. I've worked as an employee. I can do this now because Mammy Banter, of those 80,000 followers on Instagram or those 450,000 on TikTok, going to be a few people that need some help with their marketing. And even though I didn't have any testimonials from clients, all I had was references from employees and who wants to start a business on that? It's not very credible. I thought to myself, there's going to be people here that would know someone or as someone who needs some help with their social media marketing. And Mammy Banter is my case study. Yes, I don't have any testimonials, but I can use her as leverage to show that I do practice what I preach to do to show that I've grown my social media accounts in the last year and also to show that it's not just because of a few funny videos it is actually based on the basic principles of social media marketing increasing engage engagement and boosting your account so this is me I've got the account um, Mammy Banter on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. We'll talk about this later. I find Facebook less, far less engaging um, for my followers and my target market than Instagram. TikTok is over 500,000. I have since started up Catchy Co. I'm in the first month of that. It's been absolutely crazy. I haven't got time to think. Um, and I find that I'm just getting under the groove to be able to hopefully next month or the month after it is just a startup I have to put the work on now we'll be able to relax and dictate a bit more how many clients I take on and how many hours I'm actually doing a week because at the minute I'm right back to the rat races where I was before working for a corporate company and I don't want to be there I don't want to kill myself working I really really don't I didn't set up catchy co uh, with the dream of being rich, I set up Catchy Co with the main priority of allowing me some flexibility, some independence, um, and also the ability to do mommy banter at the same time. So that's where we are today. Um, next week, I'm actually launching my first merch range. Um, and I've also just got signed, and I can't say too much, by a leading um, publication house to write a book. 
based on mummy banter, my alter ego. So these are the types of opportunities that I've got from social media alone. So I'm hoping um, this is me selling myself again, that I can practice what I preach. And I'm not just jumping off a TikTok account going, I know everything. I am proud to say that I have been making a difference to small businesses, large businesses, um, and freelancers, no matter what size you are, over the last 15 years. And that paired with my experience and the knowledge of where social media is today is hopefully going to help you guys to feel more informed, more educated, and more comfortable with how social media works because there are so many myths, so many misconceptions, there's so many rumors. And I do hate when women feel as if they don't understand something because when we don't understand something, we don't feel comfortable with it. So I'm hoping you'll come away today empowered because of what you're going to learn and understanding how the algorithms across social media work so that it'll allow you to start creating content that's going to engage people, which in turn will boost your accounts and hopefully boost your conversions if you've got any outward links then going to... um, your website, or your online shop. So before, oh, sorry, bear with me. I'm going back on that one. So you can stop me at any time if you want, if you have a question. I'm going to start stop now after this slide um, for a broad Q&A if anybody has any questions about me um, personally or professionally. And then we're going to get into the theory. I will promise I'll try not to make you fall asleep. It is going to be interesting. Um, Laura and Orla can contest to that. They didn't fall asleep this morning, so it was a big one. You don't have to keep your camera on if you don't want to. Don't worry about it. If you do find that Zoom is starting to lag, sometimes it helps to turn off your camera and speed up the, the connection. I'm going to send this presentation, this slide deck, um, to Orla and she can share it with you all afterwards so that you can use it as a reference. As well as that, I do share some online tools that you can use throughout the presentation. So we'll collect those and packages, package them up and Orla can forward them on to you as some event assets. So I'm just gonna pause and see if anybody wants to unmute themselves or raise their hand. Do they have any questions? Let me just expand you so I can see all your faces. Anybody, somebody better have a question. Come on. Don't be shy. Karen, good woman. Hi, Tina. Hiya. Um, so Daddy Banter has a page. So how does he fit into your into your brand? And how does he um how does he deal with with t- uh, TikTok and Instagram fame through you? Daddy Banter which is Mark, my husband, is a bun man and loves being a bun man. Works for the local council, absolutely loves it. We set up our TikTok pages on the same night and he is actually a lot more naturally funnier than me, but he sometimes misses the mark and he won't kill me for saying this, sometimes misses the mark and how he applies his content the hashtags that he uses, times that he posts. But he's no interest in listening to me. No interest whatsoever. He's quite happy just putting up a poster, TikTok that he thinks funny and having a bit of banter online. He doesn't see it as anything that's potentially going to be a career. I think he loves being out doing a bun run and uh, getting the old daddy banter. But there is a downside. What do you hear this? You are getting tea today, ladies. He's getting tea today. He was out doing a bun run two weeks ago. Um, and it would be him and two other guys. And they genuinely just go around and lift all the buns to a point. And then the lorry drives over and they load up the buns onto the, the, the truck. A video surfaced on TikTok with this, like, do you know that music? Wow, 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 wow. And it was some woman in her house. And she was like in an updoor, upstairs bedroom, videoing him, going over to get the bun, bringing it over. And then he was stretching, he was stretching his back and she was zooming under his ass, right? So I'm like, I thought it was hilarious, completely freaked him out. He was like, 
I'm out working, lifting buns. I'm a bum man and there's people taking videos of me. I was like, mm. this is what you have to deal with now. But it was, it freaked him out. He was like, no, I don't think I like this. He didn't like it. Um, I've had some really weird experiences with the kids recently that is they really upset me like we were in a park last week and I was with my five-year-old and I'd say about 20 young girls probably between the ages of nine and ten bombarded us had their phones out and he was only looking to go to the park and I felt awful they were like can we do a TikTok can we take a picture can we do this and I was like girls I'm sorry you're all under 18 or under 13, you have to be 13 to be on TikTok. I'm not allowed. Your parents have to consent to me doing anything. And you can't be taking pictures of me or my, my my little boy. And he was like looking at me. He's only five, but he's looking at me going, what were they doing? Why was that for? So there are downsides. Don't get me wrong. There are downsides. And we haven't been out much because of lockdown. So I think it's only recently we're going to be able to see maybe the downside of it a bit more. And it just shows that you can't just lift your kid and go to the park. When you want, and that's sad. So, Catchy Co is the backup plan. Angie, you have a question. So, I am bursting for love with you. Oh. For you. you have me, honestly. I was swimming in the sea with Orla this morning, and you've been in lockdown, my number one hero. I'm a psychotherapist as well as a Michael. And why I'm telling you I'm a psychotherapist is because. There's been a lot of seriousness and difficulties in this last 15, 16 months. So I want to firstly, openly come out of the closet and say how much I love you first. Oh, Angie, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious. I mean, I've got quite a few questions, but I was curious when you mentioned the book, how, because I was trying to visualise that, how is that humour in that kind of sense? Because I know when I look at you and I yeah. start the bell, laughs and I'm kind of really watching you now and it feels like you're in my room and I'm and, and I have that engagement in my body and that's when I have the belly laughs and I'm trying to figure out how will that translate into a book yeah so it's going to be a fictional book but it is going to be based on Mammy Banter and the, the theme of the content is the theme of the content that I put up now but it's more it is going to be harder to portray reactions. As you say, you can't see facial expressions. You can't see movement. So it's all about how we're going to do that through language and the type of language that we're going to use. So it is something that's scary to me because it's new. I've never wrote a book. Um, I have got copywriting experience um, and I'm thinking, could this flop or could it not? But it's a great opportunity, Angie, that I can't turn down because it is something that could potentially open the door for TV or a series. Mm. I guess I was wondering, yeah, no, no, sure, sure. And I think sometimes these platforms are a kind of stepping stone and, and it won't always be you and kind of social media and the social media content. So that will have to be fluid and flexible. Um, I, I was wondering, is that going to be like almost like a kind of comic book? Is it going to be like illustrations? Is it going to be like a comic strip? So, yeah, I was just curious about all of that. So we're genuinely just at the brainstorming stage. I have to have the synopsis on for next week. And then it's a lot of collaboration and working together to try and storyboard it out. And as you say, just determine what kind of fiction it's going to be with illustrations. And as you say, it's hard to... to kind of imagine a scenario or as you say with illustrations or images so that's something that they're going to help me with that I don't have the knowledge to do as I say I'm, I'm not a publicist I'm not an editor so I'm looking forward to it because it's going to be a challenge for me I'm looking forward to it because it's a great opportunity but it is very very scary the thought of going out there and putting a book out to the world but it's an opportunity and who am I to turn it down I mentioned it to you guys just to let you know that again, there's so many opportunities that can come with social media and it's not just for business specifically. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you, Angie. And thank you for your kind words. It was very, very lovely of you to say. I really appreciate it. What about anybody else? Anything you want to ask? Anybody? 
I'm, I'm going to ask while we're waiting for other people to put their hands up. Did you spot the opportunity straight away, Serena, or did they naturally unfold? Or like day one, did you have like a big vision of, I have, no. a, I have a book on my dream board, or were you prepared to let it unfold? Not at all. I think um, the book didn't even come into my mind because it's short form video content. I thought because people a lot would feed back on as Angie says about your mannerisms and it's not just the context of the video that makes it funny it is how you deliver it and it's so I never ever thought about a book I did think about potential tv but I was worried about tv and I'll tell you why I don't want to be away from the kids for long so when the opportunity of a book came up I thought well I can do this from here and it's funny if the opportunity of tv comes up I don't know if it's something I would go for Maybe potentially it's very short term, but I just don't want to be away from the kids when they're so young. I don't think it's 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 in my my dream board, as you say. But we'll see. Anybody else any questions before I move on? I'm trying to see everybody. I think we're all okay. I think everybody's ready to crack on and learn some. I've got I've got one more question just now, if that's okay. Go for it, Angie, of course. So I was thinking about your television, so I'm just getting a bit creative here. You know the, what's his name, Brendan, the Irish guy, and he dresses up as a woman. He's got his whole family there, and he was unemployed. What's, what's his name? Mrs. Brown's boys. Oh, Mrs. Thank Brown's you. boys. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. So I was thinking you could have something like that, like and involve your family, and then you were killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> Even Check them what the me. and also engaging with your family, you see. Okay, it would it would be brilliant. It would be brilliant, but sure, you never know, Angie. We'll see what what comes down the path in the future. Mammy Bunter is definitely something I have to protect because she still is in a stage of growth and it mightn't look like that on the surface when you see I've got 100,000 followers, but in the grand scheme of things, she does need to grow more and I need to protect the brand. I don't know if you've seen, um, when we're talking about how Mammy Bunter um, mixes with business, there's a lot of opportunity to do paid promotions on Instagram, especially when you've got over 100,000 followers, you can earn some great money. I've turned down so many because they don't fit with the brand. They don't fit with me personally, and I know they won't fit with my audience. But I have come out and been honest and said, I will be doing some advertisements. I am monetizing from Mammy Banter. She takes my time. She takes my effort. I don't think anybody sees in the background what goes into her. It's not just getting the kids to bed and going on and doing a video. You know, she, she does take up a lot of time. Um, and I am out my own now with Catchy Co, so I do need to monetize on her, but I will be very selective on the types of products that I will be advertising. And I won't do anything unless I've used it, tried it, or feel that it's something that everybody would benefit from. I put up one post, one of my first advertisements last month was um, for a brand that I used. And this lady comes on and messages me and says, Oh, you're just another Insta hun. I'm leaving. Unfollow. Direct messages me. Um, it's a it's a pity too. I really liked your content. I thought, well, fuck. I didn't reply back to her. I'm protecting the brand. I'm not going to get into a war of words with somebody on Instagram. I blocked out her name, and I shared it on my story just to say to set the scene because I thought, look, if there's other people following me. And they're thinking the same. They don't want to see adverts. That's fine. Let me put it out there and be honest and open. I will never try to dupe anybody into thinking, oh, look at this pen. This pen's the best pen I've ever had. I will never use any other pen. Swipe up, that's going cold. I, I don't, I, may, I have made fun on my skits and reels of influencers like that. And I never, ever want to do that. But I wanted to come out and be honest and say, look, if you're feeling like, um, you don't want to see average. You have a couple of options. You either unfollow me, but that's a shame if you enjoyed my content, but no love lost. Completely up to you. You can skip through the ads if they're on my stories, or if you see it on my grid and it says hashtag ad or ad break, just don't go on to it. I'm trying as best as I can to be as honest as I can. Everything, if it's an ad, it's hashtag ad. 
if it's a real post, you'll know it's a real post. I'll never try to do any sneaky ad adverts or monetization. But again, that's a great example of how opportunity can come with its downsides. If I was to take up every single um, paid promotion offer I got, I wouldn't have an audience. It would just be like fucking QVC, a really bad QVC with a dairy woman from her hair up all the time, no face wash. I just, it just wouldn't be there. I see accounts personally, subjectively, that I know are just filled with adverts. Like, what's the value for me? So I know that I need to protect her as much as possible. I could monetize the life out her for a couple of months, but I won't do that because that's not protecting the brand. Can I ask, a, can I ask a follow-on question from that? Mm. So based, I don't want to ask a personal question, but based on what you know about small businesses and their budgets and our budget, how accessible is paid promotion with an influencer to most small businesses? There is a range depending on their followers, but the issues for small businesses at the minute, there's two ways of doing it. If you come across an influencer who is linked and with your business, so you notice you're doing some market research on your followers and you notice a lot of your followers are following this person. So that must mean that there's a lot of people out there that you could potentially attract to your account by doing a paid promotion or a collaboration with them. That is necessarily the way it should always work. But what you should do before you go down the road of paid collaboration is you should start engaging with them and creating a relationship. Otherwise, it just looks like you're in there. You don't know this person. You know their fault. You're just looking for new followers and it's cold and people can see that it's cold. So you need to interact with them, engage with them. If you contact an influencer about a potential paid promotion, you'll notice on their bio, they'll either have their email address or DM for collaborations. If the email address is a personal email address, like a Gmail or a Hotmail, it means they're working themselves. They don't have an agency or DM. You'll notice on my profile, I have Mammy Bunter at A3 Artist Agency. That means I work with an agency. Any influencer who's working full time and has loads of followers will need an agency because you personally do not have time for admin and collaborations and going back to people to say, sorry, I'm not interested or asking people for more information. It's too time consuming. You can't do it. So I have an agency who take a cut. They're professionals. They cover me legally and it's the best way for me to go. The downside of having an agency is you will definitely have to pay a lot more as a business for an agency. There is room to maneuver, but sometimes they will overshoot. I've had to turn down a lot of local business um, from bigger brands, I'll not name any names, because they're, they were used to paying influencers, younger influencers, a third of what my agency was quoting them. And I lost them and they came back to me personally. They try to go around the agency and I was happy that I lost them because it wasn't a fact anyway, but they came to me and they were like, it's such a shame. There's so many people in your market are doing this. And I was like, number one, why would I do this? I don't use this product. It's not authentic for me. Number two, it's not monetary wise. It's not valuable for me. They were looking for um, a monthly thing where I'd have to spit out their ads and their content once a month. And it was for a very low amount of money. The contract was all over the place. So it was a good decision for me not to go down that route. And the reason that um, I overcame that was because I had the agency. If you do notice um, an influencer or somebody you want to do a paid promotion that has a personal email account, they may have a rates car that they'll come back to you with, but there's more opportunity to bargain with somebody with a Gmail account or give them a gift and experience rather than work on a paid promotion. They're probably always gonna be more than willing to hear what your budget is and then work it from there. Thank you, thanks for that Serena. And Sarah's asked, 
can she ask what point you decided to get on board with an agency? Um, they contacted me. The agency contacted me. Um, I was getting loads of requests at the time, but I, I was genuinely ignoring them from businesses because I was scared. I was working full time at the time. And I was like, Jesus, the tax man's going to be after me if I start doing advertisements. Everybody in Derry is going to be saying, she's working full time and she's doing advertisements. I shit myself. I was like, I can't go anywhere like this. I can't do advertisements. I need an agency. I need somebody to protect me. So when I had got the wheels in motion and planning to go out on my own, I went with the agency then because I said, look, they'll keep me covered. I'll be able to get my accountant then and I can start to monetize um, mommy banter in an upfront honest legal way I'm just curious about like at what level your kind of account was that when you started you know attracting people then contacting you for you know for representation like were you at were you at quite a high level at that stage no the local queries would come through um from around between five and ten thousand I was getting loads of local queries and you get some really crazy queries um from some accounts that I think they're just, the majority of them are bots. So you start to re realize, right, this is real, this isn't real. Um, as I grew then over 20 and 30, I noticed the brands were getting larger. And then from 50 to 75, I was like, right, okay. Um, it was larger organizations, um, some global organizations, some UK wide. And again, I didn't know where to turn. So it was great, the agency approached me. You're welcome. Has anybody else any questions? I'm just double checking through. Nobody else get their hands up. Okay, ladies. So what I'm gonna do is go back to sharing my screen. So can everybody still see the presentation? Sarah, I can only see your face. Can you put your hand up if you can see my presentation? Can you see Dr. Evil there? You can't, okay, bear with me. Try again, I've just updated it below. Thank you very much. There we go. You can all see it now? Perfect. Let me just minimize all of your... Orla, if you can hear me, it's saying Zoom is not responding. Still online there? Um, I can hear you. I can hear you. It should be okay. okay. Listen, if I go off, I'm doing this to me on Zoom all week. Um, Zoom quit unexpectedly. One second. You're still on Zoom. It's just a bit slow to um to share your screen. Sorry, guys. Just restarted it there. Okay, Orla, can you see my presentation again? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Guys, we will crack on. Bear with me if I disappear, you don't hear me. I will just reload Zoom again. I've had to do it a few times this week, unfortunately. Technology is not my friend. Okay, so what are we going to cover? Today, we're going to talk about the do's and don'ts of Instagram and why video content is so important. I want to dispel some myths about Instagram a few of these tips and um, slides you may already know. Hopefully the ones that you don't know, you fully understand them and it gives you a fuller picture of the user journey through Instagram, the type of content you need to be creating and how the algorithm scores your content and posts it out to more people to help grow your account with new followers. We're going to talk about tips to increase engagement with existing followers. We're gonna talk about the benefits of Reels and IGTV. And we're gonna talk about understanding your Instagram analytics, which are so, so important and so valuable. We're gonna talk a bit about staying on top of trends. And as mentioned, I'm gonna include some tools, online resources that you can use to help create better quality posts, as well as search and research hashtags. And we'll cover that when we're talking about how to crack the hashtag game. Because hashtags, I find most people are literally just, I just guess them or I just make sure they all have 
the word business in them or I don't know. Hashtags are a myth. To some people, to marketers, not so much. And hopefully this helps to tell you why. So after today, I want you all to come away knowing and understanding fully how the Instagram algorithm works. The algorithm is essentially the technical process of Instagram in how it pushes and presents content to different users based on their interests. The algorithm is based on the principles of psychology and basic human user behavior. I want you to understand how you can calculate engagement rates and how to choose, find and follow the best hashtags. Again, we're gonna talk about some tools that will help enhance your posts and your overall profile. And we're gonna talk about why it's so important to communicate with your audience and engage with them as much as you possibly can. We're going to talk about why it's important to mix and match your content, so not just a full feed full of images. We need to snickle in some videos in there and combine those with some stories and interactive content, potentially alive now and again, which can be downloaded to IGTV. If anybody's been using Instagram um, for a few years, I want you to, to realize that Instagram is not the same social media platform as it was two years ago. It's not even the same social media platform as it was six months ago. And we'll cover that shortly. Try not to get obsessed about bots and hearing people talk about bots, this, that, and everything. Trust the process of natural interest, interaction, and human behavior, because that is what the foundation of the Instagram algorithm is based on. We're going to talk about why you should never bombard your posts with hashtags. We have reviewed studies and we'll present you with what our advice is in the sweet spot in terms of the number of hashtags you should use and what types of hashtags they're going to be. You should come away knowing, and you probably know this already, don't ever use low quality images or videos on Instagram. Instagram does not like it. Don't go day by day. And I'll mention this a few times. If you find yourself week in, week out, day in, day out going, Shh, I have to post something today. What will I post? What will I post? You will waste more time doing that and create more rework for yourselves than it would to just take out, say, a Monday morning, three hours on a Monday morning or whenever you can, whenever fits into your business schedule to research plan and schedule your content. And there's a few tools that can help you do that. So, Instagram of the past. If you can remember, when Instagram started out, you were presented with content on your feed in chronological order. It was presented to you based on when a user or an account posted content it was very much like the old school Facebook. You'll notice that that has now changed on Facebook as well, that you don't see content in the chronological order. You can see posts from a week ago. You can see posts from a month ago. The reason you're seeing it, however, is because Instagram, the algorithm, believes that you might be interested in it. We're talking about the content you see on your Discover page. We're talking about even content on Facebook that you see from people that you follow. It's not chronological anymore. It's based on your behavior previously in terms of if you've interacted with similar posts on similar topics, using similar hashtags or similar trends. That is done now on Instagram. Instagram are trying their best to move away from the phrase Instagram versus reality. Instagram has got a bit of a bad rap in years gone by due to heavily filtered and photoshopped images, the life of the rich and famous, going on to see these perfect people in their perfect houses with their perfect kids and their perfect lives. And that personally for me was a reason why I started to feel like I needed a social media detox until TikTok came along and until Instagram has since changed their algorithm 
and also added the ability to view short form video content. So now Alt Instagram have realized that users were starting to dip, that over 800 million people downloaded TikTok over the last year. And feedback from focus groups were based on the whole perfection of Instagram. Our demographic in particular seemed to get sick of the whole my perfect life, lady lying in a yacht in her Gucci swimming costume. We don't want to see that. Personally, to me, I loved the way I was able to go on TikTok during a global pandemic and I was pulling my hair out homeschooling to see that other mothers were doing the same thing. I couldn't see it on Instagram at the time. I wasn't actively looking. I wasn't actively, actively engaging with content, so it wasn't presenting anything to me. So Instagram listened up. First of all, they've added on the element of reels where you can now upload content using different sounds and audio and use trends and post those to your grid using hashtags. They're continually improving and continually trying to catch the coattails of TikTok. Originally, you could only do a 30 second reels. In the last few weeks, they've upped it to one minute. But they've also significantly changed their algorithm so that they are presenting users of the app with content that they probably will be interested in based on their previous behavior. That previous behavior could be engaging with a post or a topic or a user who's quite similar to other content and users and hashtags and trends. Three key signals for Instagram and their algorithm to tell whether a post, a reel, a video, whether that content has got the engagement factor. Number one is interest. So Instagram needs to know once it presents you with that content if you're interested in it. And interest could be interest could be a like. It could be a comment. It could be a save or a share or a tag. Timeliness, big, big signal for Instagram to tell you well you've got the engagement factor is whether the user has spent the duration of the video watching it, engaging with it, or they've just swiped on. There could be a few factors on why they haven't. One is making sure that you post your content at the right times. The example I use for me personally, if I post out an Instagram post or a TikTok at 3 p.m., let's say yesterday, because the kids have finished up here, that's school run time. My target demographic are out collecting their kids, getting them home, doing homeworks, making dinners. That is not a good time for me to post. If I do it anyway, Maybe a fleeting view waiting in the car for the kids to come out. Somebody could see it and they might just swipe on past. That does my account and my posts more harm because it doesn't give Instagram the timeliness signal. So I'm already marked down. I've lost the interest because they haven't got the time to watch it. So that is why it's so important to create content that is encouraging the user to stay on longer. AKA a video versus an image. You're going to stay on longer on a video than you are an image or a micro blog, for example, you're going to spend some more time. You're only going to have that time if the post is posted out at the correct time for you to actually spend time watching it. So that's why it's always important to review your insights and look at the most popular times that your target market or your most popular demographic, your audience, your followers are online. Another huge signal is relationship. Relationship is engagement from the follower or the viewer of the content, aka via a comment, but then a signal back from you that you either liked their comment or replied to it. Maybe somebody replies to your story, answers a question, votes on a poll, any of the engaging features that you can now use on stories. That is follower to creator engagement. It's a relationship, but it's only half of it. If you then responded back to that person with either an emoji or thanks for your feedback or yet me too, that is the full relationship. It's creator to follower, follower to creator. 
And they're the three biggest signals for Instagram at the minute. 2021 and 2022 is all about engagement, all about engagement. And it's all about how frequently you're posting engaging content. And then the communication from you to your audience and so on. It, cracking the great mixture of engagement, frequency and communication sounds extremely difficult. But once you start to understand, and hopefully through this session and afterwards, once you understand that this is what you need to do to start getting your content out there, is think about the content that you like to see when you open your Instagram and you go to the Discover page. Has anyone ever opened it? And for instance, one of Mammy Banter's videos came up. Is that how you found me? I'd be interested to know. We can talk about it in a little while. But just as a scenario, a lot of my followers find me through the Discover page. And it's mainly my reels that lead to followers. Fact that it's a reel and it's between zero to 30 seconds already means that they're going to spend more time typically if it was just a post. The hashtags that I use are hashtags that I research for my most popular demographic within my followers, which is related to moms and mom life and relatable content for parents, moms of Instagram. So Instagram pushes, I post out my post first of all, and it gets great engagement from my followers. So Instagram doesn't stop there. Instagram's right. Okay, so your followers like that. Hmm. So maybe followers like your followers will like that because they like the same interests. They're following loads of the same accounts. They're actually following that hashtag and they tend to like uh, reels. So let's push that out to a batch of similar users. And that's how Instagram is, gets receives the validation by first of all, pushing it out to your followers, going through all those signals, tick, 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 right, we're ready to push it out to a new audience. Let's get you some new followers. And that's the way the process goes. But it is easier said than done, and it does need a bit of thought, research, and planning to go into. it. If you step away from thinking that Instagram is social media to help you grow your business and think about it this way, it might help. Instagram is a business that makes its money through advertising. Instagram are corporate brands and companies' uh, client. The Instagram are the customer, and the actual brands are paying Instagram to push out their content. So Instagram needs the credibility of being able to show these larger brands with huge advertising budget that they have X amount of people using their app within their target demographic. They're able to tell them how long they spend on the app, how long they spend on average on a post, engage, like, and how likely they are to actually click through, take an action by either following the account or clicking through onto a link in a bio to a website to convert by signing up for a service or through their Instagram shop if they're using one. So that means that we need to be part of that and create that audience, not just for ourselves, but for Instagram. So we're kind of working together with Instagram. The more we create engaging content that's going to keep people on Instagram for longer, on Facebook for longer, on TikTok for longer, we're helping them with the case that they have users who actually enjoy staying on the app, are presented with relevant content. They're able to predict what kind of content advertisers can push out to certain demographics. And the same goes for you guys to know that your content is going out to a group of users. If you ever do paid ads on Facebook or Instagram, you need to be assured that it's going to be going out to the right people. Yes, you can choose the demographics, but are they engaged? Have they liked and converted on previous posts like this? It's up to Instagram and Facebook to do that for you so that you can then reach more accounts through paid advertising. And Instagram will do it for you in turn for free if you are creating engaging content. 
Instagram of 2021 and 2022 is moving away from including likes in its engagement calculation of your post. What they're more interested in now is comments, saves, and shares. So this will hopefully help you to get an edge over any competition who don't realize this yet. This is common knowledge, and you get this by subscribing to Instagram's marketing blog, which I'll include in this for you guys. These are the types of blogs that you get the knowledge to see trends coming down with social media. So while you might be obsessed with how many likes your post has, it could have a thousand likes and three comments, versus a post that has 50 likes and 80 shares, 14 comments, what do you think is going to do better? Likes are soon going to be obsolete and are not going to factor into that analysis of the quality and the engagement of your post so that it's validated to Instagram that it can go and push it out to more. This is to stop be people buying fake likes and fake followers. Instagram are cracking down on that now. They want to see authentic engagement via comments, shares, and saves. So this means that you need to start thinking about the content that you're creating and pushing it out there. You need to ask yourself the question, What's the value in this piece of content? Who would share it and why would they share it? If you have no answer to those questions, your content's not going to be engaging. Unless it's humorous, unless it's emotive, unless it's something widely subjective that creates conversation. My content gets shared quite a bit because it's relatable and it's humorous. If you're selling a product or service, it's going to be a bit harder for you. But you have the knowledge, you have the, the insight into your industry and your products or your services. What you need to do to make it valuable and make it engaging is start to merge your product and business knowledge with trends on Instagram, or TikTok or Facebook and keep it obviously true to you and your brand, but to step out of your comfort zone a bit more to get more visually appealing, rather than putting up a picture of a product, do a video review, do a before and after, and we'll talk about how you can do that shortly. I am just gonna stop there before we go into hashtags. Is anybody any questions on the algorithm? Does that make sense? Give me one second. Angie, were you speaking there? I was just, um, yeah, I was wondering if you, because I know that you can buy on a monthly basis, um, you know, kind of uh, platforms or programs or whatever you call them to kind of put in. So I could put in, um, I don't know, um, I might put in psychotherapy and then it gives me a number of kind of options of the hashtags that, it suggests that I use like mental health, mental health awareness, well-being, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering if you use one of them. Yeah, I have a couple of recommendations. They're in this presentation and I'll be sending out the hyperlinks for you after this. I'll be sending them to Orla, sorry, and she'll forward them on to you. Super, thank you. Thanks, Angie. Harry? Hi, yeah. Um, I was, Hi. I was going to ask about, um, you were talking uh, about engaging committed users. Mm -hmm. I've got a product based business and I find that the probably the most the bigger percentage of people that engage with my posts are other product based businesses um, okay so, um does that make any difference to to how Instagram kind of rates it or is a is a comment a comment and it doesn't really matter as long as they are really authentic accounts it yeah. doesn't matter it's engagement now, the okay. only issue you might have there is it will continually post out your content to those product mm. businesses. Yeah. Whereas you, what you need to do is think about how you can shift that to be more B2C rather than B2B. Okay. And think maybe about assessing and looking at the content and saying, why are so many? Can you give me an example about like what a few of the comments would be? Oh, now you're asking. <laughs> um, oh, I just... <laughs> got my reels going there um I don't know yeah just I think people will 
no, like because it's uh, so I, I'm, I'm an artist so I design um prints that go on things and so people will just comment on oh this is gorgeous or this is we love this or you know that kind of thing so people are saying that they like what I'm doing but I guess I'm just wondering if it matters that that they're it com because it comes from a business account than a sort of a personal account. It it doesn't matter. It feels as if that's an account that's trying to create some engagement for themselves as well. And maybe on looking to see if they can steal some followers by putting a comment under a post to go, hey, come and look at mine. It could be a sneaky way to do that. Uh -huh. um, there is an issue there where that is not your market. If they're not converting, Hattie, if they're not going over to your um, Etsy or your website to purchase these uh, prints or any of your art, if it is just industry bigging you up and it's other artists, you know, that's fine. It's engagement, but there's a gap there. 100%. You need to have a market on there that are tagging their sister saying, mom would love this for her birthday, for example. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. So it could be something to do with the hashtags you're using, Hattie, which I would say it probably is if you're too, industry focused on your hashtags rather than relaxing it a bit more and putting it out and doing some research on your actual target customers mm -hmm. for instance teacher's gift was trending this week on instagram okay. you know you yeah. need to think outside the box and what people search for when they're looking for something to buy um or people posting like new home ideas um you just really need to get outside the box and use the tools that I'm going to recommend as Angie has asked to start thinking about the behavior of what people that purchase art or might purchase art are searching for and engaging with on Instagram at the minute. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. No problem. Has anybody else a question? Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, so I, myself and my business partner have a service-based business. We are very new, so it's a, we started trading in November, so, and we're just embarking on social media just now. Okay. Um, so we don't have, we don't have analytics at all. So how would, like, like how would we research for the best times to um, start putting out posts and, I mean, it's a bit of a boring. It's like an accountancy service. We do payroll, so it's not like we can. Okay. Add, like, I feel it has to be quite serious. But how do we kind of bring the content that makes that engage in? I mean, who wants to engage in payroll? It's probably no. I know you. You just have to think about it in a different way. So let's think about as a as a scenario, Karen. Your target market are small to medium sized businesses. Would I be right in saying that? Um, we're a wee bit more niche than that. We're, our target market is for people who employ someone in the home, such as okay. a nanny, such as a nanny or a carer, um, like a private a private carer. Or but this employee is a is a domestic employee. Okay. And when you did your business plan and you did market research, were you able to identify who your target market were or any demographics? Um. I wasn't involved in that stage of the of the business, so that that side of it I don't know. And um, okay. I was brought on as a business partner after the company was incorporated. Um, so I, I I don't, but I do know like our demographic would be um probably affluent professionals who can afford a nanny. Um, mm -hmm. where, what time they would then engage on social media. So you can get broad studies um, simply by jumping on Google. Okay. Um, there are so many sites that you could type in a demographic and it will give you on average per location, broad okay. location like UK. Okay. Um, me, like just off the bat, would say if it's people needing a nanny, nanny they have kids. So yeah. the best time to post is probably um, after bedtime okay. or on a Sunday morning. Or a Saturday okay. evening. But what would be good to do to validate who your target market are, are is going back and speaking with your business partner about the business plan and when that was done mm -hmm. and what was identified 
as your confirmed projected target market and the demographics, disposable income. There are so many tools that you can use yeah. that will help you to establish what that is because you haven't got a baseline for it at the minute yeah. because you've no Instagram account, you've no insights. Yeah. That will help you then to obviously shape the type of content that you're going to be putting up, Karen. I know it does have to be professional, but you can get quite creative with it. And we'll talk about that shortly, how you can merge professional services with trends that are specifically of interest to your demographic. Magic. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Sarah. Hello. I've actually got a lot of questions, but I think you're going to answer more as we go along. So I'm not okay. going to bombard you just now. But um, there was a couple of things I just wanted to ask about. Um, like, see that. So I previously had a business account on Instagram mm -hmm. and had grown it quite significantly with a lot of hard work. And anyway, for whatever reason, um, I'm no longer able to use that account and I'd ha I've had to start again. Okay. Um, and I've noticed this time that the that the it's, it feels like a slower climb. I'm wondering if you would all, so what I'm trying to say is from that first business account, I feel like I got a really good idea of the, you know, the insights, like when I should be posting. And my target market hasn't changed. I'm basically doing exactly the same thing now as I was doing before. Okay. But what I found with the business account was, although it gave me the insights, it was quite restrictive on, like the ways I felt I could be creative in using it. Like I really like using the music and things like that. So in my new account, I've kept it just a, as a personal account. Creator, but, yeah. So I'm just wondering how important you think the ins like do your ins have your insights changed? Have your sort of like have they? Massively. So do you feel it's really important to still have that function? Especially the post by post insights and the discover insights because otherwise how do you know what's bringing new followers to you sarah yeah and then if you are able to see that instagram are working on the issue with business accounts on reels um it's been brought up three or four times this week actually in a few different sessions they are working on it if you can't see what's working well and what is bringing new followers to your account or what is creating the most engagement Per post, you will you're posting blind. So it's no really point. that specific per post. Per post, you can see where people find you. Well, it was via the homepage, the discover page, or people that are following you. Mm -hmm. You can also see who's actually tapping onto your bio link from a post. What that next conversion is. You get so many insights from your stories in terms of who's interacting, if you're adding a swipe up link, who's clicking on it, who's coming out of your stories because they're bored. You're able to see so many trends, specifically post by post. Yes, it's great to see times that people are posting it and days that they're active. There are other way, tools to do that, but the post by post insights are so, so valuable. And I would highly recommend using them. Okay. Hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Have you another question, did you say, Sarah? Well, I'm pretty sure you, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're going to answer it anyway. So I'll maybe hold off. I've got a few All more righty. I'm pretty sure you're okay. going to answer it, so. We'll crack on. It is 10 past two. Um, we're about to get through whatever we don't get through. And if I have to fly through a few slides, as mentioned, the presentation's going out to Orla. And we'll pick it from there. I am just going to share my screen again. Bear with me. Can you guys see my screen? The hashtags page? Okay, thank you. So everybody here, if you don't know already, um, you should know that hashtags are so, so powerful. So, so powerful. And they are essentially what helps the algorithm to know blindly without watching your video or seeing your image, what your content is about. It's essentially braille for the blind Instagram algorithm. Let's it know, lets it know what it's about. If you're using hashtags that have no relation to each other and you're using 40 hashtags just because you like to use certain hashtags, you've had success on one post two years ago, or um, there's something that's trending or Taylor Swift's new albums out and you're using those hashtags, it will harm your posts more than help it. There is no myth 
about hashtags. There is a way that you can define what the best types of hashtags to use are. And those are the right hashtags for your market, for your target market, either based on what they're following, what they're interested in, or what's popular or trending for that market at the minute. So let's use professional services as an example. Um, and let's say that it is consultancy, but it's specifically, let's say in Orla's case, it's specifically consultancy, coaching and training for busy moms. You can combine your professional services hashtags like mindset coaching, business coaching with moms of Instagram because they are your target market. So you've got your professional services and then you've got your target market. The best thing about having insights is you're able to see right down the hashtags where people are finding you on the discover page based on the hashtags that you're using and what your existing followers are engaging with. The beauty about Instagram is that you can now see and follow hashtags. You've got so many tools within that little app to help you for market research by just staying on top and keeping your finger on the pulse and having a look at your existing followers who are essentially your focus group. If they've got a public account, you can see what hashtags they're following. If you've got competitors who are absolutely smashing it, and I'll say it again, these are social competitors. They might not necessarily be within your specific niche or within your area that you're directly competing with. But if there is someone who is absolutely smashing it and their content is related to your market, have a look at the hashtags that they use. Have a look at the hashtags they're following and then follow them. Follow your services hashtags because that means you are going to get presented with the most up-to-date and engaging content on your Discover page so that you're able to see what type of content is being delivered to your followers. It'll help you to stay on top of trends, if there are any, what songs are, 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 are your competitors using, for example, on their reels? Is there a trend where you're using a specific placement of your hand? You'll start to stay on top of that rather than having to go search for it. We're gonna talk about how you shouldn't use too many and what the number that I advised to use in terms of hashtags and what not to do and what to avoid when you're using hashtags. So we've talked about um, your market segments. So an easy way to, to see the right hashtags to use for your target audience is to look at what your direct competitors and your social competitors are using. So Orla and I, as an example, have the same target market. Yes, it's broad, Orla would more focus on those moms that are in business. Whereas I use a kind of catch all. I would use the hashtag mumling. There's no reason why Orla can't go, she's my social competitor. She's got loads of followers that cross over into the same demographic as me. So I'm going to start to see what she's using and I'm going to trial a couple of her hashtags that are broader. Because you can get too niche. You can get too niche in terms of the hashtags you're using and too specific. So these are what we call catch hashtags. That if you hit the right tone with your content and it's engaging, Instagram will push it out to that broader group, that market segment hashtag. Insights are so important, again, because you can track the success of them. Not all hashtags are going to work. Some that you need to avoid can damage you. And there's a few ways that you can do through insights to see what hashtags are the best to use and have got the best engagement on your posts. But there are also other tools that I'll include that you can see are the most popular and creating the most engagement for others. It's good to use branded hashtags for your brand or your product. But if it's something that's really 
close to you and you only and you've made it up, I recommend that you only use 11 hashtags. If you hashtag something that has nothing to do with your content, it's a phrase that you coined yourself, or it's nothing that's going to interest, or something that maybe is on your inside professional world that your target market don't know about, like a product name that you're just launching and you're hashtagging the product, don't waste that real estate. Don't give up one of your targeted hashtags to put in a brand name or a product name that nobody knows about yet. So think very carefully when you're using hashtags. Stay on top of what's popular. There are a list of hashtags daily. Angie, there's tools at the bottom of the screen. You might not be able to see it, but again, they're going to be linked and sent out to you. All hashtag.com or brand mentions. There's loads of tools out there that you can use that you can essentially go and see the top trend in hashtags per day, per week, per month for each social media channel. You can pepper these into your post as long as they relate. If you offer payroll services, for example, there is no point in you putting the hashtag fashion in there unless you're doing something about fashion and payroll. If you try to shoehorn a trend and hashtag into your content, into your uh, hashtag list, and let's just say 11 for argument's sake, you're diluting the quality score of your collaborative hashtags. And it sticks out and it alarms TikTok that you're or Instagram that you're just jumping on something that's popular. And you're confusing the algorithm and it doesn't like it. And it won't push your content out as much as it could potentially go. So for a strong mix of hashtags, what you need to do is include those that are specific for your market, that are specifically products or services that your market might be searching for, that your content is related to a trend or a topic that your target market are interested in. But remember, your content has to have something to do with that. We had a laugh this morning about being able to go out and mix the fact that Love Island 2021 is trending with offering mindset classes. And it's like, why would you do that? Well, you could create a reel that's focusing on the most, I don't know, trending new member of Love Island. I don't watch it myself, but again, there's a huge demographic of women, moms and young women that watch it that you would be able to create a themed reel with maybe Love Island music with a Love Island green screen image in the background, but that you're here to talk about how you can change your mindset if you were on Love Island and the best way for you to succeed and apply different elements of the services or the products that you provide. Then and only then would you be um, able to jump on that hashtag. Why? Because your target market are interested in it. Why? Because it's a trend and they know that you also like a trend that they're interested in. Why? Because you're getting ahead of the game and mixing what could previously be seen as boring type of flaccid content that you usually only have in an image. And you're making it fun. You're being creative. You're adding some color and you're thinking outside the box. And your followers will be here for it. They will engage with it because you've done your research. You know they follow Love Island. Or they know, you know they follow a specific topic or a product or they like a specific song. Instagram will love that because your engagement scores go going up. There's shares, there's saves, there's comments, there's interaction back from you. So then the algorithm pushes it out to followers who aren't following you to their discovery page based on their behavior being very similar to the behavior of your followers. And that is how you gain new followers and gain new reach. So we'll include those tools in there for you. So the new feature on Instagram, follow hashtags feature. Not only can you follow accounts, now you can follow hashtags. If a competitor or a follower's profile is public, you can see what they're following. Never in the history of marketing has market research been so easily accessible at your fingertips with an app. And I just want to stress how 
valuable this feature is in terms of market research and having a good snoop about and seeing what your followers are following, what your competitors are following, and then you following that and having that content delivered to you daily and readily. Do not include too many hashtags. Studies upon studies upon studies have been done and they've showed that by using more than 11 hashtags, it can actually harm your posts reach and engagement score. Do not jump on to any sensitive or controversial subjects. This is a no brainer. It's a no brainer, don't do it. If it doesn't align to your brand, if it doesn't make sense and you're just trying to jump on a trend, don't do it. It is a no brainer. Be careful of hashtags that you are doing yourself that may be related to a campaign. My favorite is when uh, Susan Boyle's PR team launched the album and the campaign hashtag was Sue's album party. Susan album party. If you read that back, it says Sue's anal bum party. It went viral, but for all the wrong reasons. When Margaret Thatcher died, Twitter blew up because everybody read it as now the chair's dead. People thought the chair was dead. In Chester, there was a literary festival. The Clever Marketing team called it the Sea Lit Festival. Read that back. Clit Festival. So just be sure you've got another set of eyes. I know what it's like. You can have tunnel vision. You're so engrossed in a campaign. Um, you think something's really smart and funny, and it is to you at the time. But if you don't have a fresh pair of eyes looking over that for you, it is something that could become quite embarrassing. So just take your time when you're planning your content and reviewing it. So in a nutshell, you need to fully understand and stand by and know why you're using every one of those 11 hashtags. When you plan your content or if you go to post something tonight and you just throw in 11 hashtags, if you can't stand by every one of those hashtags and say, I know why I'm using that, I know why I'm using that, I know why I'm using that, you shouldn't be doing it. You're playing a lottery. You're confusing the algorithm and you're diluting the quality of your post. Even if the content's amazing, the hashtags could truck you up. They need to be related to your market's interest, your followers interest, the services that you provide, you can't cross over as long as they're within the same demographic interests. And that's why you need to spend some time on your research, following hashtags, looking to see what everyone else is interested in and what your competitors are following. Does that make sense? Yeah? Does anybody any questions on that? No? All right, I will crack on. Sorry, I'm trying to minimize you again. Purses and boy, every time I see her, I think about the Her album party, eh? Must have been fun. Right, let's get on to, we know how the algorithm works. We know now a bit more about hashtags and why they need to make sense and why we need to stand by them. They need to be justified by research. So. Let's talk about the type of content we need to create. There is no one size fits all for content. I can't sit here and give you a script that you're able to apply to every single different business and product offering and service offering. The one thing you need to remember is that scoring system, AKA the algorithm that Instagram uses. Instagram wants users to spend more time on the app more time on the app means more advertising opportunity for them, means more revenue. If you're creating videos as well as images and you're mixing up your content, your followers are going to be spending more time on your grid, obviously, because a video lasts longer than an image. If you've got a grid full of images, your social competitors or others who are doing something similar to you that are doing videos are gonna have more of a time score because they've got more videos. Even if they're less engaging, they're spending more time, they're waiting to see the end of the reel or the end of the video. 
you need to start thinking about videos. You need to start thinking about creating posts or videos, which might be a reel or an IGTV, that create engagement. When we say engagement, we say feedback, acknowledgement via a comment, a share or a save. The best types of engaging content are either informational, promotional in the way of a competition, humorous or emotive. So you need to think about the posts that you're sharing. In terms of informational, I love posts that teach me something new. 30 second reel and I've just learned how to uh, clean my oven with a lemon. Stuff like that, I share, I save and I share. You need to think about what you're doing in terms of if you are solely promoting products, are you just putting up that picture of the lipstick? Or are you doing a before and after? What's the value in the view for the viewer? What's going to make them share? What's going to make them com comment? What's going to make them tag their friend? Every single post is not going to be highly engaging. Don't get me wrong. You won't be able to do this every single time. But you do need to mix it up and have at least one engaging post every week. There's loads of tools, again, that you can use to make your posts more engaging. Instagram still scores accounts on their use of aesthetics. When I say that, you can feel the quality of an account by the aesthetic look and feel of the grid. Some people take it way too far. Some people are amazing at using things like Canva. If you don't use Canva, I'm sure Orla's already told you about it. Canva is my best friend. This presentation was done in Canva. All my images, all my videos on the Catch Eco Grid are done in Canva. Go and have a look at them. It's a tenner a month. So, so easy to do. So easy to do. And it creates a nice quality aesthetic. If you haven't got a brand image yet, if you haven't got brand guidelines, you need to think about that. Because if you are putting up images or testimonials or quotes or images with products, rather than using a raw image, get a nice branded look for behind it. Because if somebody shares your product image and there's no watermark, there's no logo, they're going to lose who that's from. If you put up a really funny video, or a really funny image or a meme or a joke, somebody can quite easily download it and save it and share it and steal it and use it as their own. I protect my content by creating my reels and my videos on TikTok and putting them on Instagram because that saves the stuff, saves mommy banter. There will come a time when Instagram will stop doing that because they want more people to move away from TikTok to Instagram and do it, but they do need antitrust some sort of watermark that protects creators from anyone stealing their shit. So you can define what your brand colors are. You can pick four or five colors, add those into Canva. Again, there's loads of tools out there and online tutorials that will teach you how to use Canva. Takes away the need for a graphic designer and really allows you to personalize and customize the look and feel of your grid if you're trying to pepper in some nice imagery along with your videos, so your reels and your post videos. Try not to use Instagram's own filters. Ironically, Instagram filters reduce the quality of the images. If you do want to add a filter to an image, do it on Canva and then upload it to Instagram. Again, keep in mind about the type of content that you are creating so that you have at least one or two engaging posts that give value to your audience and it's going to make them want to comment save or share the example again if you've got a lipstick and you just put up a picture of the lipstick and the packaging's amazing and it's sitting in this fantastic table in a fantastic house what value is that giving me nothing i don't even know what color that lipstick is you said it's peony pink i don't know that what shade of pink? There's a million shades of pink. But if you do a before and after, before review with no makeup on, no lipstick, 
And then the after is the peony pink on your lips. I know what it looks like. And I will share that with my friend because she's looking for a really nice pink lipstick. What is the value? There needs to be value in a post in order for it to be engaging and promote sharing and saving. Don't be afraid to add call to action to your post. When I say call to action, I mean in terms of supporting your business. I see a lot of companies doing this and it's completely fine. If you have an engaged following, it's always good to educate them on how they can support you. Supporting local business isn't just supporting you by buying your products or your services. It's also by engaging with your social media. So it's always nice to put up a post once in a while to say, here's how you can support the growth of my social media, ultimately my business. Share my posts with your friends, save my posts, comment what you like about them. And people will do it. Sometimes people just need to be told what to do and they're like, yeah, no problem, I'll do that. I do it loads for fun. I go through some of my friends' business pages, people that I've met recently, and I am saving their posts for fun. You do the same to your friends and they'll do it to you. We can all help each other build engagement. Remember to be as real as possible. Instagram, again, is trying to move away from that term, Instagram versus reality, or that's very Instagrammable because TikTok have came and knocked their socks off with relatable people, with real life stories, no airbrushing, Photoshop, and don't get me wrong, it's on there, but if you don't want to see it, you won't see it. Whereas Instagram is like, I'm not going on Instagram. So beautiful people in beautiful houses, Photoshop, line and book. I don't want to see that shit. I'm on my period. I've put on two stone. I don't want to see rich people lying in boats. I don't want to see it. I want to see real people. And especially if it's people that I potentially buy products from or use their services, I'm a nosy person. I am. We all are. I want to know the face behind the business. I want to know who you are. I want to know what you did at the weekend. Are you going out for dinner tonight? What are you having? Did you have a shit day? Because I had a shit day. And I want to know if you had a shit day. This is the beauty about Instagram having stories now. That you can go on and check in. If you have this big aesthetic feel for the product, for photographs and everything looks amazing, that's fine. But I want to support somebody I know a bit more about. And I will always support people more if I know a bit more about who's behind the business, especially women in business. We love to support each other. If I can see in the background what, me purchasing your product or your service, helping you to build your brand, is doing for you in your personal life. I'd love that because I get to see how I'm, what the end result is of my support. You don't need to have your face full of makeup and look like an absolute supermodel. People, that turns some people off. We want to see the real you. I'm not saying you can look like shit all the time. We know everybody likes to get dolled up and get dressed. That's even better because I'm the same. And it's relatable. And especially if you provide products to a target market who are a bit vulnerable, who have put on a bit weight, who are exhausted because the kids are running around. And you're there, warts and all, putting it out there. Amazing. And I think that's why Mommy Bunter works as well in terms of engagement. Because she looks like shit half the time. Don't get me wrong, she gets dolled up. But she's relatable. About waking, about body positivity, about not fitting on the jeans, about having spots, about having anxiety. It's relatable. And the way I used to feel about going on social media, I always wanted to see somebody like Mammy Panther. I just didn't know who she was yet. I wanted the platform to have more relatable and real life content. I wanted it to be a platform that I would feel safe letting my teenage daughter on not just in terms of worrying about predators and things, but I always have the biggest fear of her growing up in a world of social media. Could we? Could you imagine us growing up in social media and seeing these perfect girls, airbrushed, celebrities? I, could, I, I, I genuinely couldn't do it. And that's why I worry so much. And that's why Instagram is trying to get away from that image to be more relatable. If you haven't done it already, 
get your face out there. If you're hiding behind a logo and a brand, you don't need to come out telling people you just had a panic attack and you were constipated. You don't need to go that far yet. But put your face to the brand, come on and say hello and introduce yourself. Whether that's an image, first of all, introducing yourself, telling your story, or it's a video. People love to see who's behind the brand, who's behind the business. Instagram loves microblogging. I was talking about this with Orla and, and commenting how great she's doing at it this morning. Why do they like microblogging? Because people spend more time on Instagram. So not just watching videos, microblogging, as well as it's a story that's engaging and it's getting people to scroll and read the full thing and then engage with the post. Instagram absolutely loves it. Think about time, think about engagement. So not only can you create posts, reels, IGTV, and you're obviously keeping in mind how that content needs to have value. Stories are incredible for upping your engagement score. Stickers and features within stories where you can ask people opinions. You can do countdown to product launch. You can ask questions. You can ask suggestions and where you can eat tonight. Every single reply or reaction to a story, whether well, it's just a picture of you or a picture of your dinner, or it's one of those interactive elements where it is a quiz or it is a question, ups your engagement store. Every time you go back and react to someone engaging on your story, ups your engagement store. Mix and match your content. Don't just make it all photos. Don't just make it all photos and videos on your grid. Get active, get interactive on your story as well. Some of you might already use Reels. If you don't, again, there's a huge benefit to doing it. Instagram is trying to compete with TikTok to try and get some relatable, humoral, humorous, informative, and emotive content creators back over to the platform. So many benefits. You can easily jump on trends. You can use them to show off products. You can do product reviews. You can teach tips. What would previously just be a, an infographic you probably got information on your blog and your website already to form this content. My five top tips on how to wake up looking absolutely gorgeous. If that is something you do, why is, it should be a video of you. If you don't want to talk, that's fine. Put a, a nice song behind it and point to the tips. Tip two, tip three, tip four. You'll see loads of people doing that. That is why. They say a picture speaks a thousand words. Mm -mm, not on Instagram. A reel speaks more than that. A microblog speaks more than that. A story, a lie speaks more than that. The term, a picture speaks a thousand words, is gone. It is dead. RIP. It's gone. You can use reels to do some behind the scenes if you do products. If you're doing art, for example, what does it look like when you're getting some orders ready? What does your packaging look like? What's your process to send it out? You provide services. How do you get prepared? Do you have kids? Maybe you don't want to show your kids. That's fine. Show how messy your loving room is. Show the kids' toys lying everywhere. Again, give a relatable insight into who you are. Personalize your brand. And it will be more relatable and attract like-minded people within your target market. Reels are a great way to reuse and steal people's content. That's what it's all about. The premise of TikTok is using people's sounds jumping on trends and creating similar content and then slightly customizing it for yourself. You've already got ideas out there, especially if they relate to your target market or even your product or service. Maybe it's something one of your social competitors has done. You do it too. Is it like for like, that's okay. Do it to build up your confidence. Nobody's going to come and say such and such did that and that other thing. Uh, duh. That's what the premise is. That's what it's for. Whenever you do your reads, you can share them to your Instagram story or you can share them to your feed. Instagram is given more engagement and boost power, aka reach, to people using reads at the minute because they need to compete with TikTok. Again, you might have already used Instagram Lives or IGTV. You can use a live 
um, to build more of a relationship with your followers by doing a live Q&A or a live demonstration. Again, the beauty about this is that you can download your lives to an IGTV. You can add a caption, you can add your special hashtags, but you can also add a link. Can't do that to a post. The beauty about an IGTV is you can add an actual hyperlink, which is amazing because otherwise you're using a post to say my link is in my bio. So, so important on Instagram to be responsive. By being responsive, it means that you are engaging with those that have taken the time to engage with your content. Could be replying back to a comment, could be liking a comment. It could be somebody mentioning your post or sharing it in a story. It could be somebody replying to your story with an emoji or an, uh, you've asked where's good to eat in Belfast. People take the time to do that for you. You need to take the time to do that back within reason. The way I am with Mommy Banter at the minute, it's impossible for me to reply to every single comment and every single message. It genuinely breaks my heart because I feel people take the time to do that. I hate looking like somebody who can't spare the time to get back to them. I really do. It kills me. Instagram isn't killing my engagement rate because I try to do as much as I can within reason. So there's a percentage of how much actual engagement you need to be doing based on how many followers you have. Don't do none. Do whatever you can. If you're low on time and someone sends you a message or replies, reply with an emoji. As long as you're given some acknowledgement, it doesn't need to be right away. It can be later that evening or the next day. Be consistent. I mentioned earlier that the Instagram algorithm is based on human behavior and psychology. Humans love habit. So the algorithm loves habit. If you are known for posting every Tuesday at 8 p.m., Instagram will pick up on that and your followers will pick up on that and they will return every Tuesday to see what you've newly posted. If you usually go live every Sunday evening, Instagram will pick up on that. So will your followers. It gives them habit. They know that you're consistent. You can choose what's best for you. There's no rule of thumb. Nobody's saying you need to post every third day or every second day um, at the most popular time that your demographics are online within this time frame, or you're going to be marked down. No, you just really need to start to build up a level of consistency. And you'll only get that by sitting back and starting to plan and schedule. The sites like Hootsuite or later.com will help you do that. But I can't stress enough, being able to plan ahead using tools like this will save you time in the long run. It is a big task at first. You have to start by doing your market research. If you get ideas throughout the week, jot them down in a notepad. If you see a reel, save it, uh, screenshot it on your phone. But then when you're actually going to pair that up then with your hashtags, try and get yourself ahead at least a week. Because then you can spend the time that you would flap on about thinking, what am I going to post today? On replying to comments and engaging with the engagement your followers has given back to you. If you have found that your account has gone dormant, or you're having to build up your account again from scratch, it is not too late to re-engage your audience. By using the principles that we've talked about today and understanding the algorithm, what hashtags you should be using, what kind of content you need to create, times and the duration that you need to be posting, when and where, and what those topics of content are gonna be about, you can still bring up and increase your engagement. Don't write your account off just yet. If you've had content in the past that's maybe either flopped or was when you were just starting out your account, don't bun it. Go back, reuse it. If you have a nice image that you did, if you have a nice infographic, if you've a microblog, turn it on the video. Still content, still content. So feel free to do that, rebrand it up and reshare it. If you're stuck for content ideas, a meme never fails. 
there is no law or no punishment for Instagram for using somebody else's meme. If it is relatable to your target market and your service, use it. Just make sure to tag the original creator. If you can't find them, tag the account that you got it on. Memes are a great way to fill a content gap, especially if you're short out ideas. And they're also extremely shareable, extremely shareable. Everybody loves a meme. So again, you can reuse old content or you can steal somebody else's. There's no law about stealing memes. I am going to pause. I know we've only 15 minutes left before we get into insights to see if anybody has any questions. Can I ask just about the memes there? Should we brand up the memes like for the aesthetic view of our grid or would you just, because I see like today FM brand up the memes and they look like they fit into their grid or would you just share? Yes, it's entirely up to you. It depends how much time you have. See, as long as you're tagging the actual original creator, memes can always have their own look and feel anyway, but it's fine for you to add a logo to it. But if it is an active, a uh, content creator or a competitor that's done it, you're not going to rebrand a branded one, if that makes sense. This one here is free for all. There's no logo on it, nothing. This is an old picture that people add text to. And it's free for all. That is the life of memes. Unless it's something specifically and originally been created by a brand or a company, don't rebrand it. But those ones feel free to do that. Thank you. Serena? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Dee. Hi. Um, I have a question about hashtags. Yeah. Um, does it matter where you post the hashtag? In your original um, post body or in a comment? Because I see there's a lot of... To do it in the original post and don't do... Caption dot 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 hashtags that confuses Instagram. The algorithm is like, is this spam? What is this? People do it because they think you know they don't want to see Instagram hashtags. They want to see hashtags, and you can't see them on your grid anyway. You can't see them in your post. Do your caption, return, and put in your eleven hashtags. It's fine. Thank you. Can I ask a question about um? if you are ever oversaturated like if you're ever like feel like you're like how many posts per week do you recommend because I sometimes worry that if you're posting too many times it's almost like oversaturating your audience and what I've noticed having had a little bit of a break um, in the last week having previously posted a lot and very very consistently um, I was getting less sort of again I know you've talked about the likes but I was getting less likes per post but having taken a little bit longer away from the app and come back and started posting again but less frequently I seem to be getting more likes almost like they were like oh I feel like they almost got too used to the content okay do you mean followers would you have a breakdown of followers to new followers were like no not not so much followers because that's trailed off a bit um i need to i need to do some work on that i'm more talking about like engagement with posts so people commenting people liking what i've noticed is that like i was posting quite a lot and now that i've scaled it back a bit people seem to be engaging a little bit more so um, the people that are engaging and liking and commenting, are they people that follow you, Sarah? Yeah, yeah. They are, okay. So they're not new followers. Okay, no worries. There could be a few reasons for that. It could be that the hashtags that you're using aren't being seen by new people on the Discover page and it's primarily just going to your followers. Okay. Your content will not always show up to your followers. Specifically, okay. you'll notice that I have friends content that I don't see. It doesn't be presented to me unless I go to their profile. I don't know if anybody else is the same. Okay. The fact that your followers are seeing your content is a good indication that they're either going to your profile and visiting it every day or the hashtags that you're using are too niche that they're just for them. Okay. If it is just too niche and it's people that are highly engaged and interested in you, Sarah, they're going to your page every day to see what you've posted. 
rather than the, the other way about they're being presented with it too much. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sometimes a break can help. There is no rule, there's no rule of thumb, there's no magic number on how much you need to post. There are conflicting theories from marketers that three to four times per week is the optimal amount. Uh -huh. But the fact that you can now do stories and lives reduces the amount you need to post. You could have one quality engaging post per week, a story a day, a couple of stories every other day. It just depends on the engagement. You could post every single day and have zero engagement. Mm -hmm. And what's the point? Mm -hmm. There is no magic theory for that, Sarah. It really just depends on how engaged. It sounds as if you've got an engaged following mm -hmm. who are coming to see what you're doing, what you're posting every day, and then they missed you. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, she's back. Yeah. Can I ask one more very quick question then? Yeah. Um, is there a rule of thumb between, you know, you, you were talking about like following specific hashtags, right? So that obviously takes your followers up, who you're following that number up. And I've heard that you shouldn't be following more people than, than is that not true? So you it's can a math. Follow, right. It's okay. A math. okay. Complete math. Pamela, you had a question. I did, yes, thank you. It was about um, third party scheduling platforms. So I don't know if this is a myth, but I keep hearing that Instagram prioritizes content that's been posted like into the app as opposed to from a scheduled post from Buffer or later. Is that true? Is that no, rubbish? No, the complete myth. Okay, complete good. Myth. Phew. <laughs> as long as you go back to what we were talking about at the very start, as long as your content is keeping users on the app for longer and creating engagement, Instagram don't give a shit where you're scheduling or posting from. Okay, good. good. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else any questions? I am just very conscious. We've only got 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do is briefly go through um, insights, unless anybody else wants to I asked you. one last question. Yeah, I, feel like it's a, I feel like it's a good one that maybe other people might want to know. If you see when you're talking about keeping on top of the trends, right? Do you have like do you have a dummy account that you try things? Like you just seem to be really naturally good about staying on top of all the trends, the reels and then this and then that, right? When you're trying out these new things and you don't necessarily know what they're gonna look like when they're actually posted, would you recommend like almost having a dummy account to try things out and see how they look? Um, no, just use your drafts. Okay. Just use your drafts, that's what I do. Practice, practice, practice and use your drafts. I get what you're saying about a dummy account, but it's just, creating another login for you yeah. and you could do something by mistake yeah. on your business account that's a draft <laughs> um it's entirely up to you it's whatever makes you comfortable sarah but i yeah. just use my drafts nothing i do is one take never never ever ever okay. um just to let you know that and practice makes perfect and the more you do the more confidence you'll get okay thank you are we happy to fly on through insights then Okie dokie. I love that we mean why that. So you've got on Instagram, if you're a creator account, you won't have access to do this. But if you've got a business profile, you need to go on and have a look at your insights if you haven't already. Insights are so valuable. Again, at your disposal. In this little app, you've got so much market research for your target market of followers, your little focus group, to be able to tell you um, things like when they're most active, what days, what times, what demographics, where are they in the world, what age range is most popular. You can then drill down into how many profile visits you've had, how many people have clicked your website. You can look at this by post. You can look at discovery to see how many times you've ended up on that discovery page. So how many times, how many pieces of content has Instagram pushed out to followers, to people, sorry, who aren't yet following you. You can drill down into individual posts to see that the actions that were taken. You can see the user journey through your stories to see how many people exited after a couple of seconds, or tap next to go forward to see more. 
If you add a link, you can see how many people swiped up to click that link. There is so, so much analytical insight around your content by specific post, around your followers in terms of their activity and their demographics, and then your audience about what they're following, what they like about your posts. And it will help you to determine and identify any gaps or any trends. Insights can let you know what worked well. So we love to see what works well. And we apply that to what we're doing next. What didn't work too well? I spent loads of time, for instance, doing a reel that got no engagement. Why didn't it do well? Let's have a look at the hashtags. Let's have a look at what time I posted it. Let's have a look to see if it actually landed on the Discover page. Insights tells you all of this and takes away the guesswork. You can see how many times your posts were seen. So a specific post, for example, what the reach was, how many people seen it. You can then see the engagement, the likes, the comments, the interactions then in terms of shares and saves. We can't see shares anymore because of GDPR, which is unfortunate. But we can get an insight into the reach versus how many times it's been seen divided by how many shares and likes multiplied by how many followers you have. And I'll send out a few examples of how you can cal calculate your engagement rate per post. You can obviously see what your top posts were by week, by month, by year, top stories and your top IGTV videos. Again, allowing you to identify trends. What do your followers like? What content gets to the discover page more? You can see what people are doing with your content. Are they interacting? Are they replying? Are they clicking through onto that link? Are they hitting your shop button, your email button? You can see how many followers you've gained over a specific period of time. You can also see how many you've lost. Looking at your insights now before you put whatever you've learned today into practice is going to give you that baseline figure. So, for example, you've got 900 followers today and on average, you've been gaining 50 followers a week. You start to put this into practice and notice that your followers are starting to increase on average per week. Great. What about engagement? You'll be able to see that increase as well. So go on today before you do anything, before you apply anything that you've learned today on your Instagram and screenshot these baseline metrics to see how you're gonna improve them, give yourself a target or some goals, or just to see where you're starting from today. And if anything you apply, say in four weeks time, you look back and you see any huge impacts in following or engagement or reach. You can use Discover, as mentioned, to see where your posts showed up in feeds. Sometimes it's really hard to see where a follower's coming from. But if you use Insights, you can see. So a post that you can put up if you put the right hand image there. You can see 4% straight away of accounts that saw this post weren't following you. It was seen by 298 people. There was 376 impressions from home. 300 people seen it. From your profile, so people going directly to your profile, 32 people seen it. From Explore, 10 people seen it. So that's somebody searching for a specific hashtag or a topic. And from other six, other could be somebody sharing it into a WhatsApp group, tweeting about it or sharing it to their story. So you always need to know where your followers are coming from. It's all well and good saying, yeah, my followers are starting to increase, but why? Where are they coming from? What's that baseline? What's working? What's not working that I need to improve? So insights are so, so important, not just for your posts on your grid, but also for your stories to see what people are interested in. What are they exiting at? What did really turn them off? What was I talking about today in my story that really turned them off? How many people are going forward and want to see more? How many people are going back to see what I was previously talking about? Because that's great for engagement. They're actually going back to, to watch it again. And again, who's replying? Who's actually replying 
be a reaction, a subjective comment, or by engaging with something that you've put in your story, like, can anybody give me suggestions for X, Y, Z, or ask me a question. Your insights takes away all the guesswork. So that is us. We have one minute. And I just want to ask if anybody has any questions. My Zoom's doing this thing again. Can you all still hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. I probably stopped the screen share. That might be what you're noticing. No, 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 that's okay. So anybody, any questions, feedback, good, bad or indifferent, Zoe? Hi, thank you so much for today. It's been absolutely amazing and very insightful. Um, my question is about the accounts. Now I swapped from having a business account to having a creator account because it gave me the ability to have any music when I was doing my stories. So I get quite a lot of engagement from my stories and I certainly noticed that going up when I swapped to a creator account because the kind of stuff that I'm posting, it's good to put a little bit of music yes. to it. Um, and you couldn't, you can't get, so you can't choose any song if you're a business account. I so know. is that the only way to get into my insights is by switching back to business account? The only way, a few people have asked this earlier on today and throughout the week, Instagram are working on it, Zoe. So stand by. Um, a lot of businesses are complaining about it to them. Um, but don't feel too disheartened. If people are enjoying the actual content, don't focus it all down in a particular track. I understand what you're saying. It limits the type of content that you can create, but try and find the next best thing that you can find. Those insights are so important, especially if you're here today to learn how to enhance and grow. You won't be able to measure if you don't know where you are now. So you would say swap back to the business account? I would swap back because you can go back and see, you can compare if you've done a business a story on the business account with a certain track, but then you've done it on a creator account with a certain track, jump onto your insights and compare those to see what they look like. And then the guesswork will be taken out. You're saying you feel as if you're getting more um, interaction. Justify that, go onto your insights and have a little look. Maybe you want to stay as a creator until Instagram figures it out and fixes it. You can still apply what we've talked about today. But I just feel Instagram for anybody who's going through a lot of guesswork and questions and looking to put some quantitative goals in place, use insights. But of course, if you're not too bothered and you're happy to trick along and you're all about that content, you're not too fixated on figures or engagement, quantitative goals, stay as you are, Zoe. Okay, thank you so much. Claudia? A quick question. Um, what is your take on deleting reels that aren't performing well? So a math uh, across TikTok and Instagram on reels is they don't like deleting reels. That math has recently been dispelled. But if your reel gets a lot of engagement in the first two hours and then you delete it, Instagram may penalize you for that in terms of engagement. But if it's fairly quiet and there's not much, if there, you can't see if there's much kind of engagement in tagging people in shares, you can go ahead and delete it. But if it's something that's already picked up, unless it's anything that like a spelling mistake or anything that you've done by mistake, I would let it run. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Anybody else? And Angie's got a hand up there, but I fear she might be inviting you to stay. <laughs> Angie, you asking me about t-shirt. You're going to be the first person, Angie, to get one of my Mammy Bunter t-shirts. I bet I'm you just telling you, I just bloody love you. I tell my clients about you. Oh, Angie, I think we just became best you, I'd love, I'd love a signed t-shirt. And if you ever want to do a house swap, come to Edinburgh, come to Scotland. I've got a guest room. You're my girl. Do you want to come over and watch my wings, Angie? No. Because I've got two tweets. You, in you nearly did a free t-shirt. Two, two pubescent girls. And I just, you wouldn't want to swap my bearings, I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. 
Fiona has one here. I can't see anybody else. Oh, Fiona has one here. Fiona, sorry, Fiona. No, that's okay. It's just a quick question with the insights. So I was hmm. having a quick look at mine while you were talking about them. So when it comes to hashtags, and you said about using the hashtags that are getting the most followings or the most engagement, um, and yeah. how do you know what hashtag it was in that selection of hashtags that you put in that that was the one that like for instance usually most of mine's kind of I don't know like this particular post got a huge amount of engagements and it was from hashtags 108 of them was from hashtags so how do I know what hashtag it was from the insights that caused that engagement to go up does that okay. make sense okay. what I'm trying to it say it does it does Try not to get fixated on one particular hashtag. Okay. Try and think about the combination of hashtags that you used. Okay. So it's all about the relevance score. So we talked about having those that are specific to your product or service, specific to your target market, maybe one trend and maybe one brand. Okay. The fact that the, the you have to think about them as a family of hashtags. Certain hashtags you used together right, give just, other hashtags more power. Do okay. you usually just pick anything, Fiona? Anything, whatever comes into my head at the time. There's no ever consistency to it. Like I don't use the same hashtags ever. I literally just, okay. it depends on what I've popped up. I'll then like, like if it's a family post, I'll put like family means everything or something like that. Like I'll just, like, I don't, I don't sit there and have a set, a set ones. I just put up whatever. Okay, ones. there is a way to do it in your insights and I'll add a slide under this presentation deck and I'll show you how you can drill down. But I don't want everybody to, to get fixated on just one, purely one hashtag. But I know yeah. what you're saying. If it's obviously something that's worked, you want to identify it and use it again. Yeah, because it, it, it was hugely different compared to any of my other posts, this one particular, and it was to do with the hashtags. It got loads of other people that don't look at my account to come and look okay. at it. So I was just curious why or what hashtag it was that okay. caused that spike. I'll add that under the slides. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so, Serena, can I ask a question? I appreciate it's all subjective and we're all going to go and do our research. But like what accounts are you noticing that are nailing it? That you're like, OK, they're sharing really engaging content. They're using the hashtags. Well, are you any are, are there any that you look at and you go, wow, they are really doing that well? And, and what particular market? It could be anything because like we can explore all the different types of markets, but it's just one. It's just people that are consistently implementing what you've shown us today. And you can kind of see the results, you know, in their followers and in their. Engagement. Have a look. Have a look at I am 30 AF. I don't know if anybody follows them. Make me look, let me make sure. I have a couple, but what I'll do is rather than me write them out and you tick them down wrong, I'll put them into the resources email. So leave that one with me. And I'll list my top five. Okay. Is it that that one there they've created a backup page? No, it's okay. I um let me double check. That's what I mean. It's better for me to link yeah, them so rather than call it out to you. Can I yeah. ask a question? Yes. Do you do you do all of so you know how the, 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 the name of the game, as you've said, is about engagement, right? Now with a following the level that you've got, I would imagine to engage with all of those people back would take all of your time do you do all of your instagram by yourself or do you have do you have support with it no i do it all myself but i um, mentioned earlier that there's a level of engagement that you need to hit for instagram to not penalize you and because i've got so many followers i'd say i probably had about 10 percent engagement rate back per day i know when it gets up beyond the fifty thousand mark you are allowed a buy of such terms of engagement percentage I probably have a higher engagement on my stories because it's quicker and you can use um emojis a lot quicker mm -hmm. than actual posts but yeah. it is something that is extremely important for smaller accounts okay because yeah. it assumes that you've got less followers 
yeah. the less comments you should be commenting back to them it's just it's the balance isn't it between like we all have our jobs that we're doing we all have mm-hmm. most of us have our kids right and then I suppose for me it's just to hear from you about how you balance that side of it you're obviously like I mean stratospherically huge which is amazing and, and it's brilliant but you know I guess it's just like I don't want to be on social media or and and no. I suppose that's where it comes in about batching things and doing things like that but it's just that's finding it. the balance isn't it people do employ admins and have kind of admins in their Instagram and their lives answering questions but I don't feel like I'm there yet just because Mommy Banter is me. Mm-hmm. It would be different if it was Catchy Co, if it was my business and I employed somebody who knew about the business and was able to reply properly, but I just don't feel I could employ anybody who's not me to be an admin and reply back to comments. I love replying back to comments. I love speaking to people. Um, I love engaging with them and I want that to be personal from me. So I feel like it would take away and I feel like I cheat people yes they get a reply back but it's not me um so subjectively you can take it any way you want I try to do at least 10 percent a day there are some days when I don't get to reply to anything but I wake up in the morning for instance instead of going through Instagram for my personal use which maybe is a bad thing I'll go okay 20 minutes replying to comments now okay okay thank you I think that's all the questions. I just want to say a massive thank you to Serena. I don't know if you're keeping updated with the comments, but Gemma's comment there, I think sums up today for a lot of us, just how amazing and insightful that was and how much we've learned and how much we're taking away. So on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, ladies. It was really lovely to see you. And thanks to Orla for having me um, and getting in touch. She just knew she was kind of like, no, the girls will love it. And even in Orla's session today, we were doing a personal kind of one-day-one for her business. And every time we went to a new talk book, she was like, oh, the gears are like that. Oh, the gears are like that. I'm like, well, you think about yourself this morning. The gears are coming on this afternoon. So you've got a good one there, folks. She's incredibly selfless and always thinking about what will benefit you. And she's already started talking about the next session for September. So thank you, Orla. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will end the call and when we get everything across, we'll get a copy of this video training, copy of the slides and the resource email as well. So thank you so much for that, Serena. No problem. Orla, are we jumping on the link from this morning? The link from this morning. Could we leave it about 15 minutes? Is that okay? Yes, please. All right, folks. Thanks a million. Thank you. Angie, I'll send the wines over next week. I know. Send my girls to you. No bother. I'll not be in. Sorry, I'll be away out clubbing. (laughs) All right, folks. See you later. Bye. Bye.